What I would like to talk to you about this evening is why you should be sitting here and why you should be considering your development. And we hope that you consider your development at Strathmore, but this applies no matter where you go. Why should you be listening to people like us tonight and why should you be considering And I want to take you through a model, and it's not particularly new, but I still find it very relevant and valid, and that is Leisure Pipeline, Nolsha Wanagrata. And they talk about the pipeline of developing leaders, the pipeline of developing people. And certain companies are using this. I think it's a valuable one. And basically it is saying there are different levels of management or different levels of leadership. We start, when, and that's where most people have started their career. Most of us in this room have started our career. Where basically you're employed as a specialist. You're employed to do a job. You're not employed to manage people. You're not employed to lead people. You're employed to do a job. And what happens is we then progress in our careers and we move from where I just have to do a job to where I actually have to manage people doing the job. And so basically we've got this different, these different layers. We start off where the only person I have to manage is myself. And that's where I am a specialist. And I work as a specialist and as I progress then you make me the supervisor. Now I'm managing others. And then I progress further and further. And so we have these different layers and levels of management and leadership. And it is talking about how do we develop people in our companies to be ready for those layers, but also how do you develop yourself. The best way for me to explain many things is in a story, so I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. So the story goes as follows. You have this young individual, male or female, a Kenyan, goes to school, does well at school, does well in school, and has two favorite subjects at high school or senior school. Two favorite subjects. One favorite subject is mathematics. And the other favorite subject is accounting. That's what they love, mathematics and accounting. They finish school, they do well in school, all right? And this child is fortunate, there is some money, and they, somebody is willing to sponsor, and therefore he or she can go and study further. And therefore they have an opportunity to go to college or to university. What, ladies and gentlemen, given their favorite subjects, mathematics and accounting, what are they likely to go and study? Something around finance, because that's what they enjoy, right? So they don't quite have the money for the BCom, but they can go and study bookkeeping. So this child goes off and is no longer a child, is a young adult, goes off to, to, to college and learns bookkeeping. And after a good few years, he's got a good solid diploma in bookkeeping from a reputable institution. <coughs> and a large company like Safaricom or EABL or something employs him or her, right? Why would they employ this person? Why do they offer them a job? And the job is called what? What is the job called? Junior bookkeeper, right? Why do they offer the person a job of junior bookkeeper? Did anyone say skill? So not skill, right? Why are they not skill? No, that's not the point. He's not skilled because he never works as a bookkeeper, but he studied as a bookkeeper. So you would not employ him as a skilled bookkeeper, you would employ him as a potentially skilled bookkeeper, right? He's got a good qualification from a good institution which tells you what? Tells you he understands something about bookkeeping and it's a pretty good institution which is quite rigorous with, therefore you must have worked hard because you've got a good symbol, reputable institution, good piece of paper, this person has potential, right? And he or she does well in the interview, and you'd say, hey, looks like a guy or a girl who could do well. So they come and work for us, or for this organization, EABL or Safaricom, whatever. And they work there for probably about three, four years as a bookkeeper, right? And after three to four years, they get to a stage which everybody gets to, and we get to every year, which is where this, let's make it a male, it's easier to talk a male. This male wants to make more money. Why, ladies and gentlemen, does he want to make more money? How old is he now? 24, right? 24, 26? 26. He wants to make more money. Why would a typical 26-year-old Kenyan male want to make more money? Why does he want to make more money? He's 26. He wants to buy a car. Exactly. Somebody said, family was not yet, eh? Not yet. He wants to buy a car. If you're 24, 26, you want to buy a car, right? And that's what he wants to do. So he wants to make more money. Nothing wrong with that. He wants to make more money to buy a nice car. Nothing wrong with that. What has to happen for him to be able to make more money? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry? Well, why? Possibly. But what, 
So, but that's a long route. Possibly you have to do that. But what has to happen for this guy to make more money? Work. Why? With more hours means more money. No, he gets a set salary whether he works 10 hours, 8 hours, or 15 hours. He's not paid per hour. Well, if you have to gain experience, but he's already got four years' experience. Then you have to go out there and hustle. Sorry, he's going to go out there and hustle. Yeah, apart from getting a second job and a side hustle, because we know where you have to do it. What has to happen to him in the company for him to get more money? He needs a promotion. Now, why does he need a promotion to get more money? To get a higher pay. And what happens, and most of you work, or many of you work for large companies, what you'll have in companies is you have these pay grades, salary scales, I don't know what you call them, right? So for me to make more money, I'm not going to make more money without that promotion. Well, I'm not going to make a big amount more without the promotion. And he needs a big step up because he wants to buy it. So what has to happen is he needs a promotion. He needs to go to the next job grade or job scale. Does that kind of make sense? You have your... The next question is, what has to happen for him to be promoted? He has to what? He has to prove himself. So what does that mean? You're on the, you're close, very close. You say the right thing. So what has to happen? Let's just track it again. I want to make more money, right? Why do I want to make more money? Buy a nice car. What has to happen to make more money? Need a promotion. What has to happen for me to get a promotion? Or for this guy to get a promotion? But why? You're 100% correct. And but why does he have to perform? And this is me being a bit cynical, by the way. But why does he have to perform? He needs the relevant skill sets to perform. But why must he perform? Perform, I'm assuming, means he's going to do well in his job, right? So why? I'm being cynical, but why? Sorry? Yeah, he's contributing, which means he's performing, correct, but why? Why don't we just promote the guy? What? Yes, but why? Are you all right? By the way, every one of you are correct, but there's a, there's a cynical reason. Why must he perform? Why must he create value? Why must he deliver? For the company to be more profitable. Yeah, so what he does, so what? Are you quite correct, but why? It's a bit cynical, but it's an important point. Sorry? There's no promotion without? Yeah, probably, but that's not what I'm looking for. He's got experience, he's got skills, he's performing, he's delivering, he's adding value. The company's performance is improving, but why does he need to do all of that stuff? Prove a point to his boss. So it is a bit cynical, but it's very true, ladies and gentlemen. He needs, what does he need to do? He wants to be promoted, blah, blah, blah. What has to happen for him to be promoted? In simple terms, and it's true, he needs to be noticed. How many of you, and I'm looking at a very young audience, all right, but Anne, how many of us have ever been promoted when we were never noticed? <laughs> Nobody's ever gone to you and said, I've never seen you before, huh? Never, but I'm sure, it doesn't happen. Nobody ever gets promoted if you're not noticed. And that's a bit cynical, because you've got certain people who are sitting in the back doing a great job. Hey, you don't get noticed. Nobody's going to know about you. And it is a bit cynical, but it's true. And so everything you said about he's got to perform and he's got to go back to college and he's got to get skills is correct, but he needs to be noticed. So what does he do to be noticed? And you know why he's going to be noticed? That whole value chain, right? If I'm noticed, blah, 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 promotion, blah, 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 more money, blah, 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 then I get a nice car. Why does he need a nice car? Go to find a girlfriend, right? Can't find a nice girlfriend without a nice car. So bottom line is all of this happens, right? And this guy has to be noticed, and what does it mean? He's got to stand out. Right? Because remember, there's a whole lot of other bookies. He's not the only one. So he's got to stand out head and shoulders above the other bookies. So what does he do to stand out? And I'm not talking about the cynical stuff where he plays golf with the boss. That's a separate thing. What does he do? He's got to stand out. He's got to be noticed. So what does he have to do? And it goes back to the things you were telling. He's got to perform. He's got to, in simple terms, become the quickest bestest, fastest bookkeeper you've ever seen. You want figures, get them from him. 
You want a report? Get it from him. You want something done on time? You can count on him. You want it to be accurate? You count on him. And that's what he has to do, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. But what he does is he puts effort in being, into being the quickest, best, as fast, as smartest bookkeeper you've ever seen. Always faster, always quicker, always more accurate. And that's impressive, right? And what he also does is the good corporate game. He makes sure the bosses know he's ambitious, so he waves his hand and he makes sure they do know who he is. You've got to market yourself. And he does that. All right? And he becomes the quickest, best, as fast, as smartest bookkeeper you've ever seen. What does he do to do that? What is he reading at night? At night he's reading how to be a better bookkeeper. And after he's read that book, he reads the one how to be a faster bookkeeper. And then the how to be an accurate bookkeeper. And what I'm saying is he's honing his skills in bookkeeping. The right thing to do. Why? Because then he becomes the best and therefore blah, blah, blah. Happy so far. And what happens so often in organizations, is not the right thing, but is what tends to happen, is that he does get noticed. That's nothing wrong with it. He gets noticed while we want somebody to go to him, which is cool. What happens for the wrong reason is he is noticed. Everyone knows you want good stuff, you go to him. And then things happen in an organization, somebody leaves, blah, 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 and the next thing, guess what? There is a vacancy. There's a vacancy for a position called bookkeeping supervisor. Everybody knows this guy, quick as fast as smart as blah, 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 and they know that he's ambitious. So what happens is they're going to choose someone. Who are they going to choose? They choose the one they notice, right? So what do they do? They take this guy who's now been working for four years as the bestest bookkeeper. That's great. And they say, wow, you're great. You know what we're going to do? And you're ambitious. And we know you want to progress. So we're going to promote you. We make him the bookkeeping supervisor. Is he happy? Most definitely, right? Why? Look, the car's out there. It's clean. It's bleeding, etc., etc. He's got the car. Right? He's got the promotion, he's making more money, he feels good. And that's cool, we promoted him, and he is the best, and that's cool. So he's happy, but there's a problem. What's the problem? He knows absolutely nothing about managing, right? Now, interesting, and again, I'm being cynical, why did he go and study bookkeeping? Because he was good at finance, he was good at accounting, right? He doesn't even like people. No, so If he liked people, he would have studied psychology like I did or something like that. Uh, being cynical, but he does nothing about managing people. He doesn't even understand people half the time. Because what's really cool about bookkeeping is it balances, eh? It makes sense. People don't make sense. But anyway, he's happy because he's got the promotion, right? He is now the supervisor. So he's happy, but the problem is he knows nothing about managing people. He doesn't know how to lead people. He doesn't know how to delegate. He doesn't know how to motivate. He doesn't know how to empower. He doesn't know how to develop. But he knows how to do books. And as would happen with these stories, and always dramatic stories, as we make him a supervisor, he's happy to be a supervisor, but he's a bit confused. I don't know who do these people, or after them, in his opinion, are lazy and stupid, but he doesn't quite know what to do with them. But he knows how to do this. I don't think it's as bad as this. Lago would probably agree or disagree. But if you've got five people working for you, ladies and gentlemen, law of averages is one will be useless. Okay? What's that? 20%? Silly your not that bad. So this guy is now promoted, he's a supervisor, he's got five bookkeepers, right? So he's got five people who work for him, right? Five bookkeepers. One of them is useless. His name is? Hey, Brian. <laughs> so he's got these five, one of them just, and he's not useless, as Lava says. But, you know, he doesn't quite always get it right. Anyway, this guy is an excellent bookkeeper. But five people, and he works, as so often happens, for the, his boss. His boss is quite an autocratic guy, eh? His boss is not a patient boss. His boss comes and says, listen, you're a fool today, I need it. Right? Two o'clock, not four o'clock, don't be late. You know this guy, he is never late. He's always on time, he's always accurate, he's always perfect, right? Which is fine, he has no problem with that. Usually you want my report by four, today you want my report by two. He makes a plan, and he realizes if he starts working at 12, it's two hours to put the report together. Still no problem, right? The problem comes in is to, for him to do the report, he needs the figures, right? And who's got to do the figures? Desh, Ryan, unfortunately, the useless bookkeeper. The semi useless bookkeeper. So he's not stupid, right? He knows he goes to Brian at 10. He says, listen, it's 10. I need your figures by 12. Brian does his job. He's not very good. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he delivers. At 12 o'clock, he delivers. Why am I happy? Because 12 to 2, I can make a plan. I get his figures at 12 o'clock. And what do I see when I look at these figures? What do I see? 
error, mistake, error, wrong. Ish. I knew you were bad. I don't know. I'll pay for your therapy later. Okay, so the bottom line is what does he do? There's many errors. He's got to do the report. What does he do? What does he do? He does it himself. He hardly even looks at Brian. He hardly even talks to Brian. But Brian can see his right action. Okay? You can see from the bad body language, the boss is angry. But he doesn't know what he's done. But he grabs the stuff from Brian. He sighs heavily. He curses softly. And what does he do? He goes to his desk and he does it himself. He fixes it. Why does he do it himself? He doesn't have the time. Right? He can't do it because he can see the errors far quicker than Brian can. Right? And he doesn't know anything about developing people and coaching people and empowering people. He's never learned that stuff. So he takes it, he fixes it himself, and guess what, ladies and gentlemen? At 10 to 2, he delivers the report. Can we see the problem? What happened with this guy is we promoted him for the wrong reason. We promoted him because he was technically competent. We promoted him because he was this great specialist. And by the way, I'm not saying you shouldn't perform and stand out and be head and shoulders above everybody else. That's reality. But what was he reading at night? How to be a better bookie. And the next year, what did he read? How to be a better bookie. And the following year, what did he read? How to be an even better bookie. So he kept honing and developing his bookie business. Somewhere along the line, he's going to realize, you know what? I'm a pretty good bookie. You know what I think is I want to be promoted. I want to move from here to here. And to do that, I need to be equipped. And therefore, what I should be doing is preparing myself for this. And that's why if we have a look at the model, you don't just go from one level to the next to the next. You go from one level through a transition. And you change. And you develop new skills. And then you hear. And you perform. And then you go through another transition. And you change. And you learn new skills. And each time you move, you need to prepare, transition, and change. So basically what we see is I, I'm a specialist. Then I develop certain supervisory leadership management skills. I become the manager of others. And I perform there. And then I need to develop even more managerial and perhaps some leadership skills. Transition number two. <coughs> then I go from being a supervisor to being the manager. So going back to the story of my bookkeeper. Here is the bookkeeper. Here is the, the bookkeeping or finance supervisor. Here is the finance manager. Here is the finance director. Here he becomes the CEO. Does that make any sense? But each time we move, and in fact, before we move, we need to equip ourselves. Now, in the excuse me, enlightened companies will assist their people in doing that. Excuse me again. Enlightened companies will say, you know what, here's someone with potential. I think he can go far. Let's send him on something to help him with transition number one. And then later we'll send him on something on transition number two, etc. Et and that's what enlightened companies do, and that's ideally what your companies will do. However, if I do not work for the enlightened company that is doing it, then I better do it myself. And ideally, you can come to a place like SBS, that's ideal, but hey, there's nothing wrong with reading a book and developing your skills. So clearly, you have to drive your careers, hopefully with the aid of your company, and you need to go through the transitions. If you have a look at it and you read the literature of Nelson on the Drata, the most difficult transition, and some of you are heading there, some of you are there, some of you have been there, is transition number one. That is the most of you. That's where you've got to stop being the specialist and start trusting others. And learn to let go, and learn to navigate, and learn to do all of those things. That's the most difficult. <coughs> Again, excuse me. The next interesting, the next most difficult is number four. So here yeah, I'm the bookkeeper, I'm the supervisor in finance, finance manager, finance director, and then going from finance director to CEO is your second most difficult. Why is that? Why would that one be so tough? You're going to take charge of functions that you probably know nothing about. Quite correct. So now you are managing stuff you don't know. Or you know because you're not stupid and you've learned, but you're not the expert. You're, 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 a, you're a finance person, you're heading to be the CEO, you're not the marketing expert, you're not the operation expert, you're not the HI expert, etc. Et so the most difficult is number one, the next most difficult is number four. So these are tough, but that's the most difficult, second most difficult. Because it's not only about having an understanding of the functions. That's the first challenge. Is can I understand finance and marketing, etc. The second challenge is not only to understand it, but to value it. 
to actually see how do I unlock the value of marketing and the value of Asia. I always joke, but it's quite true. I always claim if you give me a CEO, any CEO, and you let me chat to that person for 30 minutes, I will tell you where he started his career. Or she. And why would I be able to do that? How, why would I be able to say, you know what, he started as an engineer. She started in sales. Why would I know that? If you gave me 30 minutes of it to be your CEO. You can hear it, and, they're mad, and they're, they're trying, aren't you? But you can just hear where their passion lies, right? And you'll hear them saying, you know what, in this company, hey, the guys that make a difference are sales, hey? Job. Sure. HR just waste money, marketing spend even more money, finances don't know what they do, but the sales, you, you can just hear it. And that's not wrong, but there's an emotional connection. And that's not wrong, but as a CEO, I cannot have a favorite. Right? And that's why it's such a tough job. So, what are we saying? Is we need to develop people. Now, we did not design our programs at SBS around this model, but they fit very, very well. If you have a look at some of the programs that we're running, like new managers, right? New managers, exceptionally valuable for transition number one. If you are saying, I'm heading to supervision, I'm heading to management for the first time, that's the program that you need. If you're saying, no, wait a minute, now I want to start preparing myself for that next level, then we have things like the, what do we have, the PMD, um, and, and now we're starting to get to that middle manager. And then, wait a minute, now I want to go even further, now we've got the senior manager. And then eventually, you get to things like the woman in leadership, you get to the advanced management program, program that we're running this week for the first time, Prof Lago and myself, is a new program, Global CEO. So that's beyond advanced, now we're looking at, we've got a whole lot of CEOs from Africa, and we're looking at how do we assist them to grow even further, to develop their companies, to develop their countries, to develop their concepts. That's something nice to say. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? And that's what we need to do, depending on where you are in your career, is how do we equip you, how do you equip yourself to be able to make those transitions? And if you look at what we do, obviously we're very biased and proud of SVS, but so that's what we specialize in. We specialize in how do we develop managers, how do we develop leaders, and how do we enable people to grow in their careers. We've done our job when we achieve a couple of things. The two main ones that come to my mind is you grow and develop, and are therefore able to progress in your career. But also, if your company is sent to you, yeah, your company is benefiting. In other words, the company is saying, well, it was worthwhile sending you there. If I could just take a minute to talk about how do we try and achieve that is what we do with most of our programs, certainly our longer programs, our PFD, our SMLP, our AMP, is we give people projects. In fact, people quite often have to select their own project. So you come here and we say, listen, you're on a PMD, you're going to spend four weeks, three weeks study blocks with us, maybe in January and March, etc. however it's structured. And what we do is we give you a project, and we say you're going to choose a project, find something in your company, they can be approved, find an opportunity in your company where you think you could add value, and then you can research it and also investigate it and see if you can deliver that improvement. And what we want from our side is we want to see that you have applied what we have taught you. So don't come up with something and I can't see anything that you've learned. I want to see, hey, well, you applied this, you applied that, you applied that. But what we also want to do is say, now I'm going to present what you've come up with. And that's very valuable because you are learning. We know that you're learning because you can prove it. And your company is saying, hey, you know, it was worthwhile spending the money on the Does that kind of make sense? Anyone here from EABL? One of my favorite examples, I'm always biased on this one, but if you have a look at it, in Nairobi, in Kenya, we have a product called Tusk Asylum. Not so? That came from SBS. They haven't paid us any royalties yet. Has it? We should pay. <laughs> but anyway, what happened is we had a guy. It was an SMLP, yes. SMLP program from EABL saying, you know what? He thinks he has this idea. He thinks you know what? There's a market for cider. And his project was, well, let's see. Let's design a project, a product. Let's kind of test the market and let's see. I think EABL is fairly satisfied with their investment in that particular. Case. So that's the kind of thing. That's you know that's first one. We don't always get first one. But that's what we mean by that. 